Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Rex Bell. He's going to share some stories about playing bass for the great Lightning Hopkins. It was Johnny Hooker, Clifton Chenier, Honey Boy Edwards, and Lightning. Oh, I have a funny Carnegie Hall story. First, we're doing the sound check. The sound check, you know, it's Carnegie Hall is made for acoustic music. And before the instruments are on, you can talk to the sound guy who's a block away, 2,000 seats. You can talk to him like this, I swear. But you you plug in Fender Twins, everything goes haywire. And so then the, the shocker came. They said, okay, Mr. Hopkins, uh, you're playing second. He's, and he had, man, he he had an uproar. He got mad. He he was going to, he said, well, there ain't going to be no gig then. I'm going, lightning, <laughs> don't do this. But he was, he got on his high horse. He was not going to be, he, and they said, oh, no. And I don't know who was managing the Carnegie Hall, but what brilliant people. They, they said, oh, no, you're headlining the first show. And I don't know if there was an intermission planned, but there was right then. And so... Johnny, it was at, at uh, Honey Boy Edwards, and then Lightning, and then Intermission, and then Johnny Hooker, Clifton Chenier, and then Johnny Hooker headlined the second show, and it was only two white people in all the of all the twenty two musicians, me and Johnny Hooker's bass player. Now Johnny Hooker's bass player wore raggedy jeans, flip flops, which is, I used to play bass barefooted quite often, and Lightning didn't mind that. But we had a, we had a three piece, and we we all had tuxedos on, and that was we were cool looking man. That was a cool stage, but because Lightning was so, he, he had his tux on, he looked so cool. He belonged where he was, and he knew it, and you could feel it. And he would talk to the audience. He, you know, Mr. Charlie, one of the greatest songs of all time about the rolling mill burning down and the boy that stuttered. He just blew that audience away by talking to him. Cause he could, and he should have been, well, I don't know, Johnny Hooker was great, too. I mean, what can you say? I smuggled an ounce of weed in my suitcase, which was a felony, I guess. But I managed to, and once once we were staying at the Hilton Caddy Corner from Carnegie Hall, and once everybody, once all the other musicians found out that I had an ounce of weed, they were all in my, in my room on the balcony smoking weed. Uh, mainly the band. The, the the stars stayed somewhere else. I don't know where they stayed. They might have been on the penthouse or something. But I didn't associate with Lightning in that way. We didn't hang out. We hung out at his house to practice, and he would always have me stay for dinner. And, and if the Astros were on, of course, we'd watch the Astro game. He'd like pearl beer. In fact, he asked me to smuggle pearl beer in New York City. And... I said, sure, you know, I, back then, I, the worst you could do is be hijacked to Cuba. And so I carried an ounce of weed and a 12-pack of pearl in my luggage. And I got by with it. But So in Lightning, when he was, the, the Carnegie Hall gig was the next night. The night before, it was limousine service. We had dinner at the top of the Twin Towers. It was all high-class stuff. And when they were interviewing all the magazines, Time Magazine, whatever, all the magazines and big magazines were there and Lightning would sit there with his pearl beer started to get interviewed he loved that and then he took me to the Armadillo World Headquarters and then he took me to Carnegie Hall which I knew when I went to Carnegie see he had this bass player he was a state senator I can't think of his name he was a mediocre bass player but he got Lightning all these gigs and good paying city gigs you know and but he, I was so thrilled that he couldn't play bass very good. And I remember one one of the when he played Her, Herman Park in Houston speaking, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't belong to the union, and it cost more to belong to the union than the gig paid. So I, I was just in the audience, and every time this guy would hit a bad note, and you could tell Lightning wasn't comfortable. It's so sweet. I went, job security, man. And this guy, he would, he. He wasn't a very good musician, he, but he liked to pretend that he, that he could tune a guitar. And he'd come up and tune Lightning's guitar, and it wouldn't be in tune. And I would have to go back and retune it. So he came to the Carnegie Hall gig. And I remember 10 minutes before we went on, you know, I, I had the, you know you, you, we used tuning forks back then, you know. I had tuning forks, and I had that guitar perfect. 
And this guy walked in that room and I said, don't touch that guitar. I just kind of became this other person that I'm not because I wasn't going to let him touch it. He was a big guy, too. I said, you don't touch that guitar because we were about to go on, man. And he didn't. He respected it. 